Hello, I'm Allison Carnival, and this is one of the newest places on Earth. It was created 15 years ago during a violent display of nature's power. On May 18th in 1980, Mount St. Helens exploded in a volcanic display never before witnessed in modern times. carved out this mile-wide crater, rearranging the mountain and its surroundings. For those who lived through this historic event, they were left with feelings of awe and devastation. The awe remains, but instead of devastation, we are now witnessing the rebirth of a mountain and the remarkable resilience of both nature and man. Join me as we relive that fateful day in May and examine what's happened since Mount St. Helens turned day to night and cast an ashy shadow around the globe. Before the spring of 1980, Mount St. Helens was picture perfect. Her graceful glacier-capped peak gave way to a lush green skirt of old growth forest. As her youthful image reflected in the mirrored waters of Spirit Lake, she was the beauty of the Cascades, and her domain was a natural playground. In spite of her pristine appearance, Mount St. Helens was known to be a lady with a turbulent past. Ancient tribal lore of both the Klickitat and Cowlitz referred to it with reverence as the Mountain of Fire. The first written eyewitness account of an eruption occurred in 1836. Numerous others were later witnessed throughout the 1840s, with activity continuing clear up to 1857. Beginning in the 1800s, a continuous flow of pioneers came to settle the area now known as Southwest Washington. Then as now, lumber was the prime resource. In 1980, helicopter pilot Jess Hagerman worked for the Weyerhaeuser Corporation at its St. Helens tree farm. The St. Helens tree farm was probably one of the prettiest places in the whole world. Uh, Spirit Lake, Harry Truman's Lodge, some of those things that, that we've all read about. It was absolutely an incredible area. A lot of it was still old growth timber, big six, seven foot uh, diameter trees. It was absolutely incredibly beautiful. On March 27th in 1980, Hagerman happened to be flying when news came that the mountain had awoke from its 123 year slumber. It was awesome to see that. Here there was a little tiny crater right on the very top of the mountain and probably more impressive than the little crater, although that was impressive enough, were these big cracks that went around the mountain uh, uh, from the very top, only on the north side. In the next month and a half before the big eruption, we watched the crater in, in the top of the mountain get larger and larger. Some days you'd see some steam and smoke coming out of the top. It, we'd have small eruptions. And, and then it would go quiet. And you, you know, deep down, you, you were sort of hoping that something would happen. From this point on, life with St. Helens would never be the same. As the mountain became more active, the government began limiting access within a 20 mile radius of it. The area was called the Red Zone, and people living within it, in small communities like Cougar, had to check in at roadblocks just to reach their homes. Many with property at Spirit Lake became upset when they could not gain access at all. You know, I mean, how would you feel? You want to see we're, we're paying taxes and we would, we'd like to use our property. I'm not afraid. Most people were not afraid. In fact, with each eruption, people became more and more interested in what was happening at the mountain. They couldn't resist coming to the area in hopes of seeing some action. It didn't take long for entrepreneurs to capitalize on this either by setting up roadside shops. The government tried to keep people at a distance, but there was one man who refused to heed all warnings. Harry Truman and his Spirit Lake Lodge had been part of the area's landscape and lore for 50 years. 
and he wasn't about to leave now. <laughs> no, I'm not going to leave. You're damn right I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay here. If I left, it'd kill me. If I left this place and lost my home, I'd die in a week. I, I couldn't live. I couldn't, I couldn't extend it. So I'm like that old captain. I'm, by God, I'm going down the ship. If I said, if the damn thing takes this mountain, I'm going along with it. I'd rather be dead for her than to live without it. Harry did not leave. Like so many others, he felt there was nothing to fear. Throughout April and into May, the mountain continued to please tourists and lull residents into a false sense of security, playfully blowing periodic plumes of ash. However, beneath the surface, it was preparing for something much bigger. Scientists monitored earthquakes which shook beneath the mountain daily, and the north face of St. Helens had begun to swell. The flank was moving out laterally by as much as five feet a day. For two months, the mountain was literally being wedged apart. The bulge, as it was called, visibly disfigured the symmetrical cone, in spots rising more than 450 feet higher than before. Scientists knew this was creating a highly unstable and dangerous situation, but they had no real idea what to expect. We don't know if we're very close to slides at this point or whether we're not close. And another critical thing that we do not know is whether or not it would go all in one grand motion or whether it would go in many small rock balls and avalanches. Joel Harvey turned 10 years old on March 27, 1980, the same day the mountain erupted for the first time. To celebrate, his father took him to see the volcano in their backyard. They made their first trip March 30th. Then as the bulge kept getting larger and larger, and they said there was, the scientists said there was going to be a major eruption, we decided to go up there the, the, the weekend before it was supposed to happen big time. Dorothy Stoffel and her husband had a similar idea. Both Keith and I are geologists, and we had lived uh, over on the west side and used to cross-country ski at Mount St. Helens. When the early eruptive activity began in late March of 1980, we became very fascinated with what was going on. We had recently moved to Spokane and felt frustrated that we were here and everything was happening over there. We were in Yakima while he was giving lectures about the eruptions, and he said, go see if we can charter a plane and visit the mountain and take a look for ourselves. On Saturday, May 17th, after a recent lull in activity, the government gave in to demands of Spirit Lake homeowners. Governor Ray's position on this is that she wants to be of some assistance to the property owners and, and let you go in and, and at your own risk and take care of whatever you have to take care of. People were allowed into the Spirit Lake area to gather their belongings, but they had to be out by nightfall. Another excursion was planned for the next morning at 10 a.m. On that same day, the Harvey party also headed to the mountain. Joel joined his mother, father, uncle, and neighbor. Our neighbor across the street, Willie, had this great dream the night before about uh, impending doom. He saw this large wave chasing, chasing us. And I, being 10 years old, I was promptly very scared on the way up there. And my father had to reprimand him for scaring his son on the way up. They camped at Bear Meadows. It had a great view of the mountain, yet was still about two miles outside of the red zone. Then early Sunday morning on May 18th, Joel's uncle, Gary Rosenquist, captured what turned out to be the last sunrise to touch this majestic peak. Well, he took his first pictures at 5.30 in the morning, and he, he broke his camera down probably about seven-ish, thinking that we were going to actually hike down into Spirit Lake that day. So we were basically breaking up camp, and then about five minutes before, we just heard these rocks falling in the background. And then I happened to notice that there were no animal noises in the forest, and that's, that, that's really put the chill in me. So my father suggested to my uncle at that time to set his camera back up, maybe something will happen. So my uncle set it back up and took one shot, which was five minutes before, at the same time, Dorothy Stoffel and her husband were flying directly above the seemingly serene mountain in a small plane. There was a small hole 
uh, in the floor of the crater that was venting steam. But that was really our only indication of any activity. Um, then at 832, what happened was that there was a magnitude 5 earthquake. We were directly above the north rim, uh, looking at the south face. Our first indication that anything was happening was we began to watch the shoestring glacier cave in to the crater, and we got excited. We thought, oh, a little activity. So I shot two photographs just as fast as I could. As I was shooting the second photograph of the south face of the volcano's crater, directly beneath our feet, a huge fracture opened up. It was uh, several miles in length. The bizarre thing was that the whole north half of the volcano began to vibrate, and the south half was absolutely still. Just as we digested that this was happening, we began to watch the north half of the volcano in a big slide block fall away beneath our feet. I was sitting in front of our fire, enjoying my cup of cocoa with a perfect viewpoint of the mountain, and my friend Willie was standing about three or four feet in front of me with a pair of binoculars. He was actually, he could, he could actually see the cracks going down the mountain. And as he turned to tell us this, that is when the moment happened. In a span of 30 seconds, Gary Rosenquist managed to take 22 shots of the mountain. Even with actual photographs of the explosion, it is hard to comprehend what happened. It was so far beyond human experience that what I perceived and what the pictures show were two completely different things. At that point, they say the blast was traveling at a rate of about 600 miles an hour. And our pilot, uh, realizing the peril of the situation for us, put the plane into a nosedive to gain speed to try to outrun the cloud. Um, the plane, he said he was redlining it about 200 miles an hour. Keith recognized that our avenue of escape was to turn south, and so he did and that's how we survived. Geologists say it's difficult to be sure which caused which, but as the 5.1 earthquake shook, the mountain's northern slope fell away in the largest recorded landslide in history. In minutes, it covered 20 square miles of the Toodle River Valley to an average depth of 150 feet. But before it could even come to rest, the most violent part of the eruption had passed it by. When the flank of the volcano failed, it unroofed a body of magma or hot molten rock that had accumulated inside the volcano edifice over the preceding two months. And it also not only unroofed that body of, of magma, but it unroofed the jacket of superheated groundwater that surrounded that magma body. And when, when those two bodies were unroofed, there was a sudden relief, a release of, of pressure which uh, caused the, the water in both of them to, to flash to steam in a very violent explosion. Traveling at speeds upwards of 600 miles an hour, the lateral blast of gas and rock fragments moved ahead of the debris avalanche. Joel Harvey says it looked liquid. Like water in a wavy surf, it rolled over one ridge after another, wiping out everything in its path. Uh, as it rolled over each ridge, it, the, the horror in us got greater and greater as we comprehend that it was coming closer. And we, as we saw these ridge lines that seemed so very solid in the human mind just be overtaken so easily. We, we saw the ridge line that was in front of us, and I know, I'm know i sure all of us thought that it was going to go over that one, which it, of course, did not. As it hit the ridge line in front of us, it went completely to the side. At that point, the blast went around us, which it totally encompassed our camp area. Not everyone was so lucky. 200 square miles of forest was blown down or scorched by the blast. Its speed ranged from 220 to 670 miles per hour. 
After traveling about 15 miles from the volcano, this stone wind lost much of its force. It could no longer blow the trees down, but it remained hot enough to scorch them. This created a stark narrow band of standing dead trees along the edge of untouched forest. The debris avalanche that came from the volcano contained a lot of water in it. Uh, the wet sediments, uh, fragments of glaciers that were incorporated in the debris avalanche. And after the debris avalanche was in place, it began to dewater. Water just started seeping out of it. Water from the melted glaciers combined with everything from boulder to sand-sized sediments to create mud flows or lahars, the consistency of wet cement. They swept down the Toodle River to the north and Muddy River and Pine Creek to the south. Downstream, residents like Jeannie Gaze suspected nothing. When the mountain blew, the sound went north and south, and we didn't even hear it down here. In fact, I was standing out on the deck at 8.30 when it blew, and I didn't even know it. And then when I went back in the house, all of a sudden I noticed it was getting dark, you know. And uh, I said, boy, the mountain must have blown again. So we turned on the radio, and they said it really was bad. The first mud flow came down the north fork of the Toodle River at midday, and the Gaze home was untouched. After the first blow at 12 that came through, then we had left the area. And then at 5.30, you know, we thought, well, we'll go back and see what's happening at the river. Jeannie watched from the far bank while her husband crossed the river and went back to their house. He wanted to come over and get the cat, you know, and he just, he didn't think it was going to be that bad because when it came through before, it was under the deck, you know, it didn't touch the house. So he thought we were going to be okay. We didn't realize what was going on up in the gorge. At Hollywood Gorge, the mud flow had backed up behind a dam of debris. As it flowed, it just kept jamming up, jamming up, jamming up through back to the start of the gorge. So that's a lot of mess. Warehouser's Camp Baker had been wiped out earlier, and the logs stored there were now being carried downstream. Logs and debris tore down the valley. Twelve bridges and 221 homes were destroyed. Ex extended beyond the mouth of the Toodle Valley into the Cowlitz River, beyond the mouth of the Cowlitz River into the Columbia River, and actually deposited enough debris in the channel in the Columbia River that it stopped shipping until the channels could be dredged uh, sometime after the eruption. Back at the mountain, the other half of the landslide had flowed to the northeast and crashed into Spirit Lake, creating a tidal wave. The displaced water scoured the surrounding hillsides and washed the blown down trees back into the lake. These logs created a mat which covered most of the water's surface. Pyroclastic flows, which are superheated pumice and gas reaching temperatures of 1,100 degrees, sterilized the mountain's northern flanks. Here, no life was spared. The mountain continued to erupt over the next nine hours, blowing ash 16 miles up into the air. Prevailing winds carried it northeast, producing a trail of ash that ranged from more than three feet deep near the volcano to visible traces settling in the Midwest. Yakima was the first large town to go dark. Then as the cloud spread to the Northeast, driving in central and eastern Washington became impossible. The population of Ritzville, Washington doubled from two to 4,000 as stranded travelers made their way to this oasis in the gray desert. On the eastern edge of Washington, Spokane residents could only watch as a beautiful spring day turned dark as midnight. An eerie silence fell as the blanket of ash caused the city to grind to a halt. In a matter of seconds, the entire region had changed. Before the explosion, the summit of Mount St. Helens was just over 9,600 feet. Now it's 8,300 feet tall. 1,300 feet of mountain was gone and rescue efforts seemed impossible. 
Jess Hagerman has been in Washington's Air National Guard since 1976. He was called to duty the day of the eruption. By the time guardsmen had gathered in the town of Longview, 35 miles from the mountain, reports were already coming in that no one could have survived in the blast zone. Unwilling to believe this, Hagerman got permission from his commanding officer to begin searching the area with five helicopters. We flew up the south fork of the Tootle, and of course, as we all know now, uh, the south fork of the Tootle really wasn't damaged that badly. Uh, and then we swung on up and went on over into the north fork of the Tootle and past Camp Baker, or where old Camp Baker used to be. This is when they got a report of two vehicles driving down the north fork of the Tootle River. It is also when they started running into ash. I kind of liken it sometime to flying around in a milk bottle. And it was the sky, the ground, everything was pretty much the same color flying around in the ash. We can sort of sense by this time that, uh, you know, there probably aren't two vehicles on a road because the roads are all clobbered with trees and there's ash everywhere. But then, through the dismal landscape, he and his crew chief spotted a truck. We swung around to have a closer look, dropped down a little bit, and what we did see were footprints leading from this rig down the road. And, uh, of course, then you're excited because you found some live people who have obviously been up here since the eruption because their, their footprints were making tracks in this ash. And then all of a sudden we came around the corner there and we found two people laying on the road. Initially we thought we can't land in this stuff because you get close to the ground you can't see the ground. And you never want to do that, flying helicopters. But at great risk to himself and his machine, Hagerman did land. And when he did, he was shocked by what he saw. You know, these folks were probably 15 miles from the mountain. They were on the backside of, of two ridge lines. They couldn't see the mountain at all from where they were or the way, where they had been working. And they, their faces were completely burned. I think uh, Jim Skamanke, which was one of the, uh, the guys who finally did survive out of that group of four, but anyway, uh, he had severe burns all over his face, had open sores on his face. His hands were, were black. Uh, you know, at the first look, you'd think that he had black working gloves on, but they weren't. Uh, they were just, his hands had been burned that badly. As the rescue continued, others were pulled from the bleak landscape. Some were alive, but many were dead. People like Harry Truman and United States Geological Survey geologist David Johnston, who were right in the mountain's shadow, probably had little time to react and were never found. But for others, Hagerman witnessed a different story. They obviously had seen the eruption. Uh, they had jumped in their truck and, and started off. They were heading away from the, from the blast when it, when it hit them. And, uh, you know, uh, it was probably pretty much an instantaneous death, I think. The driver still had his hands on the wheel. His head was still up. They were just sitting there uh, dead. And the passenger was sitting in the passenger seat just with his hands in his lap. With this whole rescue effort, you look around and you say, who else can do this? It's got to be done. So you, you, you sort of buck up and you, you do what, what you have to do. Hagerman says it's the possibility of finding someone alive that keeps you going. Identifying and trying to verify license numbers and those kinds of things, uh, you know, that's not a, a fun part of a search and rescue mission. Anytime you can find live people, it's, it's fun and exciting, and there's a lot of uh, variations in your enthusiasm for doing that kind of a job. Rescue crews like Hagerman saved almost 200 people following the eruption. But in all, 57 lost their lives. Millions of birds, fish, and small game, along with thousands of deer, elk, mountain goat, and bear, were also killed. The cloud of ash distributed 540 million tons of ash over an area of more than 22,000 square miles and eventually circled the globe.
it was miserable to deal with and damaged all equipment that had to operate in it. But in eastern Washington, the effects from the eruption were relatively short-lived. However, ash was only one of the problems for people right around the mountain. Cleaning up after the eruption would take years, and for many, life would never be the same. You ever been to Alaska? Yeah. Even after 15 oh, years, yeah. it is still hard for Jeannie Gaze to come back to the area. This is what my yard was like, you know, mm -hmm. and then to have it all, I don't know. <laughs> I just love it out like this. It's so peaceful. She and her husband, Buck, lost their home along the North Fork of the Tootle during the mud flows. I'd say, hey, uh, is there a beer up there? And I'd be reaching this high to get a beer off the deck, and that's where it would be. The top of the deck is right there. So that would be roughly seven feet, I'd figure, you know, that we're standing on this mud right now, mud flow. The gazes were never able to rebuild. Its classification has recently been changed, but for 14 years, the government ruled this property to be on a floodplain unsuitable for building. Jeannie says the area has never been flooded by water alone. This was our, our uh, bulkhead on the beach, you know, to keep the erosion from the hillside, and then that cedar tree there is where uh, our deck was built around that, and then the house from there, so it's, uh, it's still up, maybe six feet higher than what the normal. All the debris, the ash. Was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because this part of the disaster was classified as a flood, the Gaze's homeowner's insurance wouldn't cover their loss. The government awarded them $30,000 in flood insurance, but that was less than a third of the home's value. Nothing but debris remained, but the money had to go to the bank to pay off their mortgage. Due to the disaster, they qualified for a 3% loan to buy a new home but it had to be built somewhere else. Buck recently died, so Jeannie now lives alone in a trailer. She says her husband had never fully recovered from the loss of their home. Well, he just never could accept it. He, you know, everything he had was in the home. We, you know, we were not able to save money with the raising six children and then to lose everything you own. So he always said, when I get to heaven, he says, I'm gonna ask God who's in charge of volcanoes. So I guess he knows now and we don't. <laughs> so. The area is slowly coming back, but Jeannie says many of the people who lived here have not. I mean, you can see that there's been no action on their roads or, or cabins. Or... Why is that fear that the mountain will do it again? It's just an inner feeling. It's just an inner feeling. It's a. The devastation, the, you know, the beauty's gone. I guess that's it, the beauty's gone. And the river's been a mess, you know, and it's been changing back and forth. But like I say, now it's clearing and things are growing. And so the younger generation will come back and use it. After the 1980 eruption, there were 150,000 acres within the blast zone where trees were strewn about like toothpicks. 68,000 acres of this land belonged to Weyerhaeuser. Of that, 36,500 acres uh, was merchantable timber, timber that was old enough to be salvaged. The rest of it was young stands. Our first efforts were simply to be able to get to the area. All of the roads, many of the bridges were all washed out. We ended up opening up, reconstructing over 600 miles worth of, of roads. It was the fall of 1980 when Weyerhaeuser moved equipment into the blast zone and began salvaging the merchantable timber. About 1,000 men worked under dangerous and aggravating conditions. Trees were tangled or uprooted, and the ash constantly dulled the chains on their saws. Salvage efforts took two years total. We finished in 1982 and uh, pulled out enough timber to build 85,000 three-bedroom homes, 850 million board feet. At days during peak harvest periods, there were as many as 600 truckloads of logs a day coming down the North Toodle Valley from that blast zone area. 
It looked like business was booming, but warehouser spokesmen say that is not the case. The company's total loss due to the eruption is reported to have been $66 million. Nevertheless, Weyerhaeuser immediately began looking to the future. Between 1981 and 1987, the company planted more than 18 million trees in the blast zone. This stand uh, was one of the original areas that we came back into. Far away from the mountain as we could get, um, we put about a million dollars into some research, some plantings in the blast zone to try and see what would work and what wouldn't work, what kind of problems we might run into. And we discovered that uh, anything more than, oh, maybe six inches of ash, we were going to have to do something special. You just couldn't plant the seedlings in the ash. It was too sterile. It did not have a, the nutrients that trees needed to grow. Where we salvaged logged, it stirred the area up well enough that that was excellent for planting. In other areas, the ash had to be scraped away to expose the mineral-rich parent soil before each seedling was planted by hand. In just 15 years, areas have been transformed from this to this. Some of the seedlings are now over 40 feet tall. For scientists, the 1980 eruption has provided a unique and valuable chance to observe the course of nature. It was really a wonderful opportunity because we had a chance to look at a large-scale disturbance, something on the order of you know, 100 or more square mile area affected by the eruption, and look at a process that has influenced the forests of the Cascades for many, many thousands of years and, and watch kind of the, the rebirth of an ecosystem one step at a time firsthand. The initial expectation was that everything had been destroyed, but closer examination proved different. It has also shown that nature doesn't always act the way we think it will. Sectional theory suggests that you'll get uh, mosses and things like that would come in and then gradually some herbaceous plants would come in and then gradually some shrubs and some trees. Well here we're seeing all of those coming in at the same time. And what we've really learned is that disturbance uh, of this kind of scale is very uneven. We're standing here at Mita Lake, which is about eight miles north of the volcano, and the amazing thing about the Mita Lake Basin is that it kind of shows how the blast was channeled by the mountaintops, by the topography, that it came over on its way from the volcano to here. But also it provides an excellent place to see how life survived, even in the midst of the tremendous blast of fragmented rock and ash that swept over here. Probably the, the cloud was traveling at a few hundred miles an hour when it came over this point. And it came into the basin and it swirled around us. And you can see across the lake how the trees are laying every which way and how the blast must have just kind of circled around in this basin. And if you look behind us, on the ridge behind us, you see the, the uh, tops of the trees that are sticking up above the ridge top, how the blast that skipped over the ridge top snapped them off sheer clean breaks across them. You can imagine the force that that took. And yet, even with that much force and that much uh, fragmented rock sweeping through here and shattering the forest, you can look around us and see the evidence of surviving plant and animal life all through the area. May 18th in this landscape is still late winter, very early spring. So at that time, there was a lot of snow in the area, a lot of ice, the lake was ice covered. And the, the evidence of the snow cover and its importance of survival can be seen in this specific silver tr fir tree right here. This silver fir was probably on the order of this tall at the time of the eruption. And so when the eruption came along and blasted off the overstory, the larger trees, these smaller trees were protected under the snowpack. After the snow melted, the, the more flexible ones were able to pop up free out of the ash. And these trees are beginning to, to produce cones now, and they'll provide a very important source of seed in the blast zone. Other seeds, like that of the tenacious fireweed, blew in on the wind and took root in erosion gullies, teaching scientists yet another lesson. Normally, people think of erosion as a negative process. They think of erosion as like, oh, no, we got to stop erosion, seed it, stabilize it. But here, we were dealing with a deposit that was on the order of a few inches to a foot thick. And so we were looking at um, a relatively thin cap on the surviving material.
So it was just a matter of erosion coming along, washing that off, and the surviving plants sprouting through. So erosion was really the foundation of the recovery. So what normally would be a negative thing was a very positive one. In the Tootle Valley, where the mud flows left extremely deep deposits, nature found a way to cope foresters had not predicted. Again, uh, we learned a lesson from nature, which we've learned many. Conifer trees could not grow in the nutrient-poor ash, so Weyerhaeuser planted cottonwoods. But within two years, red alders had taken over the area on their own. And one of the things about red alder is it has nitrogen-fixing nodules on its roots. It's an association of bacteria with the tree itself that actually produces nitrogen that then the tree is able to incorporate and use. And it also releases nitrogen into the soil and will eventually cause that soil to go from being infertile to having the nutrients that other plants as well as trees generations to come, uh, you'll be able to grow Douglas fir on there again. Another positive discovery was that some animals had also survived the eruption. The same thing that was true for roots, that the plant roots that survived below ground was true for animals. The animals uh, that were underground at the time of the eruption were able to survive. Things like the pocket gopher, which lives its life completely underground, came up through the ash deposit. They were able to feed on the roots of the surviving plants. The gophers were joined by a wide array of other creatures which had their heads down during the eruption. It didn't take long for mobile animals like birds and elk to be seen in the blast zone either. Initially they only pass through, but now they stay year round. As the seasons pass and more and more vegetation comes back, so do the animals. The recovery has been amazing. There are more elk in the area now than before the eruption. The waterways around St. Helens tell another story of amazing recovery. During the 1980 eruption, entire watersheds were physically altered and became hostile to traditional marine life. We took a temperature on the College River down near the mouth and it was 95 degrees uh, after, a day after the eruption. The tootle was literally just steaming in place. It was just a quagmire of, of mud and, and water. Uh, and my initial impression was that we'd lost everything. Though the conditions were far from ideal, nature showed surprising resilience. In side streams, some fish did manage to survive. We were able to go into some of those tributaries and found all sorts of little juvenile uh, trout, steelhead, and salmon. And these are the fish that are going to be the seed source for continuing the run. So even though everything in the main stem was fried uh, with the temperatures and the sediment that we got, we had a source of, of recovery there in the tributary stream. The recovery of these rivers and streams continues, but things will never be the same. The erosion of ash sediment continues to fill tributaries. To stop this sediment from reaching the Cowlitz and Columbia rivers where it had to be dredged out, a giant dam was built on the north fork of the Tootle. Instead of holding back water, this dam is designed to hold sediment. However, it also stops fish from traveling upstream. So now they are trapped here and transported by truck above the dam. Despite all the obstacles, fishery biologists like Bob Lucas remain optimistic. Before man was here, uh, the river uh, had, had eruptions and, and recovered and, and did quite nicely. And so if we're patient and, and don't try to interfere too much, I think the river will, will be back to what it was. The eruption on May 18th not only altered waterways, it created new ones. When the landslide came down the Tootle Valley, it blocked off side channels, creating castle and cold water lakes. Cold water is now open to visitors. To create a lake of that size is, is just amazing, to, to have something like that just kind of pop up overnight. The fishermen have been extremely excited. We're managing that for large fish with a limited catch. It's just a one fish limit. People just cannot believe they're catching fish of that size west of the mountain. The Department of Fish and Wildlife planted fish in cold water in 1989. 
This was possible because it only took the lakes a few years to clean themselves after the eruption. Even Spirit Lake, which was hardest hit, healed itself quickly. When the debris avalanche slid into this valley, it physically raised the lake's location by several hundred feet. The bottom of the lake now sits above the former surface. Part of the log mat still floats about the lake. At the time of the eruption, the abnormally high amount of organic material which was washed into the water made it the consistency of sewage sludge. All of the organic material, all of the leaves and the branches from the forest that were vaporized and shredded by the eruption ended up being leached into the waters like tea from a tea bag, and that caused bacterial populations to explode. So the lakes were literally boiling with carbon dioxide and methane. In that state, the lakes were uninhabitable for marine life, but bacteria were able to clear the water within just three years of the eruption. There really wasn't a precedent for this kind of alteration of a lake environment. So, you know, and essentially everything that happened was a surprise. But you know, when you think about how fast um, bacteria reproduce and then the generations of them that cycle, um, you can imagine they would be able to process quite a bit of organic material. And obviously the wonderful rainfall we get in the Northwest, there was a lot of dilution of incoming rainfall and snow melt and a lot of stirring of oxygen into the lakes with uh, wind and waves and things like that. So the physical processes helped out as well. It helped out so much that in 1993, a fish was found in Spirit Lake. It was appropriately nicknamed Harry after the cantankerous lodge owner who lived and died here. It's a little rainbow that we did some genetic work up on, and it's not, uh, we, you know, people think that, that they've been planted up there, but, it, but it's a, a wild fish as far as we can determine. Jim Bird is the man who caught Harry. Well, we came up here without really expecting to get anything, and I set a couple nets and left them for two days and came back and was really surprised to find Harry in there, a uh, little eight-inch rainbow. At least this wind's blowing that way to push those logs away. This summer day in 1994, Bird is looking for vindication. I'm not sure everyone believed me originally that I got the fish out of here. To see if Harry has any relatives living in Spirit Lake, biologists in. have set some more nets. This lake was being studied as if only amphibians were in the water. If this is not the case, the studies must be revised. John, what'd you get? Oh, yeah. Much to Bird's wrong. delight, a fish is caught in the third net. This fish is an amazing discovery, one because of its location and two because of its size. I thought we might have a fish. I didn't think it would be as big as this one. This proves that catching Harry was not a fluke or fraud. However, it doesn't tell us how many more might be out there. I have no idea. I really don't. Um, the size of this fish would indicate to me that there are more fish out there. Maybe a good population has come back. But we don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to do some other experiments and see how it goes. If they somehow survived in this area, and they're, they're coming back to populate Spirit Lake, I mean, you know, that's, that's incredible to me. The female fish is 18 inches long and weighs two and a quarter pounds. It's obvious that she's been eating well here, but it is still undetermined exactly how she got here. Definitely uh, is a surprise that anything could come back so soon after the eruption in here in the lake. But there are a few tributaries that I think might have held a fish in them, especially if they had some ice over them, uh, which would uh, make the chances of survival a lot better if the streams were iced over and had a little snow on top of that. Uh, other than that, I, I don't really have any theories. And neither do his colleagues. Last year we did some genetic analysis of that fish. We'll be doing the same thing with this fish again. But we're just trying to get a handle on what the population's doing in here, and yeah, we have fish in here. Spirit Lake is located inside a national monument, so people will have very limited access to it. They will not be able to fish this lake, but through scientists, they will be able to keep track of what's happening here. The Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument was created by Congress in 1982. It is dedicated to allowing the natural processes taking place within its boundaries to proceed unimpeded by human activities. I think that when Congress created the monument, it clearly recognized the value of research and also the education that results from research. And that's been one of the really amazing things about Mount St. Helens is that we've had a really close relationship between the scientific community 
and um, the people here at the monument. There are always new discoveries to kind of share with visitors. So it's, it has been a, a tremendous laboratory for scientists, but it's also been a tremendous learning experience for the visitors that come here. Um, Mount St. Helens, pre-1980, May 18th. Okay. Beautiful snow-capped mountain known as the Fuji of the Americas. On the north side of St. Helens, they can see how much the eruption changed things, while on the south side, they can still get a feeling of what the area was like before 1980. We spend a lot of effort on keeping people on the trails and providing trails that take people where they want to go. But it's important that they stay on the trails so that we're able to, everybody that comes here is able to see nature's handiwork and not the effect of our footsteps and what we do here. This is a difficult but important task because every year since the eruption, more and more people have come to the area. In 1994, 5.4 million people visited the monument. The volcano is like a giant magnet and people want to get close to it, they want to learn. When Congress created the monument, it laid out three major directives. The first is that within its boundaries, nature will proceed unimpeded by man. For example, blown down timber was not salvaged here and new trees are being planted only by nature. This helps ensure that the second and third directives can be achieved. The second is to promote and provide opportunities for scientific research. And the third directive is for the Forest Service to provide opportunities for public environmental education and interpretation. To accomplish this third goal, there are several visitor centers along the highway that leads to St. Helens, and still more are being built. Yet even though they belong to different agencies, there has been a lot of cooperation to make sure each one is telling a different part of the St. Helens story. The visitor center at Silver Lake was one of the first to open. One of the main attractions of this visitor center are the two theater presentations. We have a 22-minute video and then we have a 10-minute slide presentation. The newest Forest Service Center at Coldwater Ridge has a totally different feel to it. It's actually in the blast zone and focuses on the biological story of the mountain. The stories of Mount St. Helens are absolutely fascinating stories just all on their own. But the challenge in designing an interpretive center or a visitor center is to take some of the information which is more technical and to digest it and to present it in, a, in an interesting way. You've chosen to be an elk, the largest animal. The trick is always to take complicated information and make it attractive and interesting to people so, so it'll be easy for them to understand. By studying in the monument, geologists can see how Mount St. Helens is connected to a history that dates back millions of years. Below this level, between, between here and my feet, we're dealing with a period of time that extends from 1480 A.D. back to about uh, uh, 3,300 years before the, the present. The y is right under there. What they learn here can help provide insight to the rest of the Cascade Range and to other volcanoes around the world. The most unique learning opportunities resulting from the events in 1980 had to do with the debris avalanche and blast. Pictures and eyewitness information provided by people like Gary Rosenquist and Dorothy Stoffel gave scientists a chance to understand a phenomena they had never witnessed before. Because of the observations at Mount St. Helens of the event and then of the deposits that it produced, we've come to realize that, that events like that sector collapse with its large landslide have occurred many times at explosive volcanoes uh, around the world. So it's a common event, but one that we were really never prepared to appreciate before. They are also able to watch closely as the volcano rebuilds itself. Uh, after the eruption on May 18th, the crater floor was relatively flat. In fact, there was kind of a, a dimple or depression where the vent was beneath where the present dome is. And several times during the summer of 1980, a small incipient dome began to grow in that vent, but each time a later and smaller explosive eruption than the one on May 18th destroyed the little dome, and the dome had to start over again. After that summer was over, then the dome began to, to be able to grow without 
uh, being destroyed, and it grew in a, a series of about 17 dome building episodes that occurred from late 1980 uh, through October 1986, and then petered out. The dome stopped growing at that time. Right now, the dome is about 3,000 feet wide at the base and over 800 feet tall. It is the result of gas-depleted magma left over from the eruption on May 18th. Even though the dome is not currently growing, it continues to vent steam. Its interior is still very hot. Just a few meters below the surface, the temperatures reach more than 500 degrees centigrade. Much of what geologists see in the crater matches what they already believe to be the general sequence of events that had built the mountain. But the gaping crater gives them a nice cross-sectional view of the mountain's past. As you look around at the crater walls, you see that, that much of the crater walls is composed of very light-colored rock. And that light-colored rock represents domes that erupted on the volcano, broke through to the surface, built domes, something like the one behind us, uh, about 3,000 years or, or so ago. The walls of the crater are unnaturally steep and therefore unstable. Throughout the summer, the crater rumbles like a continuous thunderstorm as boulders crash down its walls. If it goes on long enough without disturbance, it'll, it'll eventually achieve a, a slope angle that's reasonably stable, and uh, these rock falls will stop. On the pumice plain created by the landslide and pyroclastic flows of 1980, scientists can see where young and old meet. Those rocks are part of a sequence of volcanic rocks that accumulated between about 38 and 24 million years ago in a long belt extending from Mount Rainier in, in Washington State through southern Washington and, and the state of Oregon. The younger rocks, uh, which bank up against that cliff, are all derived from Mount St. Helens. And near the base of the cliff, you can see some subtle uh, hummocks that remain from the debris avalanche uh, of the morning of May 18, 1980. The horizontally layered rocks that you see in the little canyon wall are pyroclastic flow deposits from the summer of 1980. The layering that you can see uh, in that canyon wall records separate successive uh, pyroclastic flow events. In the summer of 1980, this was a smooth surface. But erosion by streams draining from Mount St. Helens have cut deep canyons into the pyroclastic flow deposits. It's going to continue to change drastically over decades. There'll be continued erosion, but on the other hand, uh, deposits in these washes will tend to fill up some of the low places too, so it'll be evolving. Mount St. Helens is the most active volcano in the Cascade Range. It has erupted numerous times in the last few thousand years, many which were bigger than the one in 1980. Geologists don't like predicting future events beyond a week or so, but this they are willing to say. It may be quiet now, but Mount St. Helens is only napping. I think it's an absolutely sure bet that it will turn on again, but I haven't any way to tell you whether that'll be next year, 10 years, or 100 years from now. Though they don't know when, scientists are confident they will be able to warn people when she does wake up. All the volcanoes in the Cascades are monitored to some degree, but St. Helens receives extra attention. The Cascade Volcano Observatory was established right after the May 18th eruption. I think the overall approach that we use now to monitor volcanoes was well known in 1980 because the Geological Survey has had a lot of experience monitoring volcanoes in Hawaii at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. But what we didn't have at the time was a team of scientists who worked together and who worked at a volcano that was showing increasing signs of activity and who could respond to that volcano at a moment's notice. When you look at a timeline in geologic terms, Mount St. Helens is not the only volcano in the Cascade Range to erupt recently. 
The Cascades are part of the Ring of Fire. These volcanoes are dormant, but they are far from extinct, and there is every indication that man will have to face dangers from them in the future. Even though it's fair to say that Mount St. Helens is the most active volcano in the Cascade Range, I think it's probably not the most dangerous. If I had to single one out as probably the most dangerous volcano in the Cascade Range, I would pick Mount Rainier. I would pick Mount Rainier because there is significant development in, in valleys that drain Mount Rainier, valleys that have been repeatedly inundated in the past by large debris flows generated at Mount Rainier. For example, the Puyallup Valley was inundated by a large debris flow from Mount Rainier about 500 years ago. What's really troubling about the landslides at Mount Rainier is that it looks like they don't occur when the volcano is actually producing an eruption. So that then suggests Mount Rainier could produce a landslide without really any kind of volcanic warning that we are used to seeing before a volcanic eruption. Geologists say it's difficult to find a balance between the risks of living where there could be volcanic activity someday versus the advantages of being there today. There's a good possibility that you could live in the Puyallup Valley uh, for a century or more without being overrun by such a debris flow. But it might happen tomorrow. It's difficult to, to know how to weigh the pros and cons. It's a balance between understanding the hazard and the social and economic uh, um, factors that, that make living in such areas attractive. Would you live there? I think I would not live in, in the, on the valley floors close to the volcano that have been repeatedly overrun by debris flows. Mount Rainier is only one of the snow-capped volcanoes in the Cascade Range that seem to beckon people closer in spite of the hazards that may boil beneath their cool and peaceful exteriors. The lessons learned here at Mount St. Helens can help make living among these giants safer, but it can't keep nature from taking its course. The landscape here will continue to change. It may be gradual or it may be violently sudden. The only questions are which and when. And for these answers, we have to wait to hear from Mount St. Helens herself. To receive your own copy of St. Helens, Out of the Ash, please call 1-800-735-2377.